Hey everyone, it's Julius with Computing for Designers. As most of you know, I used to be a product designer and the past two or three years I've transitioned to becoming a prototyper that works with early stage startups to build their first version of their ideas. Uh, that means that along the way I've delved very deeply into the technical side of things and that's why I've created Computing for Designers, which is a community meant to help uh, designers build better technical intuitions. And today uh, we're going to talk about something that I've wanted to talk about for a while. It's something that's basically taken my entire technical career to build up uh, sort of intuition about. And um, it's even quite hard for me to exactly explain every single thing involved in this topic, but I'm gonna try my best and hopefully get you to a point where you can start uh, knowing even what questions to ask. Um, today's topic is what are GPUs and shaders? And big spoiler alert, if you make software, you've already used shaders. Whether or not you knew it, whether or not you're writing the code, shaders are pretty prevalent in basically everything that we do. Uh, and late, later on, you'll see exactly what I mean. So today, we're going to talk about a few things. Right? What is a GPU and what is a shader? How do those two things relate together? Right? Uh, then we'll talk about how a shader works. Mm -hmm. We'll show a little bit of code, not too much. And then we'll talk about some of the uses of shaders, some of the practical uses day to day of, of shaders in software. So let's get started. What is a GPU and what is a shader? So uh, I don't know if you remember, but back in the 90s, the graphics processing unit really started to be marketed, especially towards gamers. Uh, my face is blocking it here, but here you can see this kid is very excited about all the graphics power of the GeForce 256, which was like the first consumer GPU. Um, and the benefit of a GPU is that it is a dedicated part of a computer, right? whether it's a gaming console or your Macintosh, all it deals with is graphics. And specifically, it's very good at 3D graphics. Right? So before GPUs existed, CPUs, right, the central processing unit, is what took care of all of this uh, graphics drawing, but it's just not as fast as it could be. And so dedicated GPUs is, uh, came on the market, and that's really the need that they, they, they solve. Right. So um, even though you know your your Mac UI or your Windows UI, it's mostly like 2D interfaces, right? Websites are mostly 2D interfaces. The technology they use underneath is actually capable of doing 3D, and really like a, a lot of the um, same ideas uh, are are implemented for the primitives that are actually used to draw the graphics, even though the output looks totally different, like a totally different dimension. So. We'll talk about something like called OpenGL, Open Graphics Language, and this is a pretty common standard for how you communicate with, uh, with a graphics card to actually draw things to the screen. And these are the actual primitives that you get on a graphics card, right, on, on, in OpenGL. You only get points, you get very thin lines, uh, and then you get triangles. There's that, that's it, right? You don't get squares, you don't get circles. And this is actually a really interesting exercise. It's like, how would you draw a circle or how would you draw a thick stroke? Like not a thin stroke, a thick stroke in OpenGL. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. And the answer is if you've ever dealt with any sort of 3D thing is, is triangles, right? Triangles can uh, approximate basically any shape you can imagine. Uh, you know, if you played Nintendo 64, you would notice all the polygons <laughs> that are very visible. And even today's realistic graphics at the very, very base level, they're all triangles, right? You can basically create anything with them. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the cool thing about how 2D interfaces and 3D graphics, they both are powered by the same, same kind of underlying te technology. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is kind of like how these primitives are assembled in this idea of like a graphics pipeline, right? So GPUs are developed around a very specific order of operations in order to turn something like, you know, a box, like a cube or a sphere, right, in 3D kind of geometry, how do you actually convert that into like a flat image that toggles on the LEDs on your screen, right? Because your screen is made of LEDs and every single LED has to express, oh, I'm a red RGB value of like this, right? I'm red, I'm blue, I'm yellow, right? So this is what a pretty standard graphics pipeline looks like. Um, as I mentioned before, even if we're working in 2D shapes and we're only dealing you know, with like rectangles and circles, we still start with uh, the technology was built for 3D shapes, right? So uh, a lot of the language around here is really based on this idea of how do we like approximate uh, 
uh, rendering of a 3D thing uh, in 2D space, right? So um, on the left, you'll see we start off with uh, vertices and ver ver vertex array. Like it's a fancy way of saying like a bunch of points in space. So in the case of a cube, well, let's say there's like six points that you can see, uh, it'll pass through the first shader called a vertex shader. And that's not what we're going to be talking about today. That's a slightly different type of shader um, that works on some of the same concepts, but it's mostly meant for like, you know, you have a cube, but you have like a camera that's moving around the cube, or you have different per perspective, like you want to do more like uh, iso isographic pers perspective, orthographic perspective. Uh, then in, in that case, you would do some transforms of that shader to make sure that cube appears in the right way. Uh, but the next step is turning things into triangles, which you kind of touched on, everything is made of triangles. Then you turn that into kind of like pixel space through rasterization. And then the fragment shader, and that's where the, uh, the most of the shader stuff we'll talk about today is really fragment shader stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll color things in, and then at the end, it'll output to what's called a frame buffer, which is kind of like a temporary space to store uh, images before they're displayed on the screen. Right? And this stuff happens super fast, right? This pipeline happens like 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second if you have you know, ProMotion or whatever. Um, and, and this is kind of the foundation of, of what a GPU uh, is and, and does. Right? And a shader, specifically in this context, is, is a little program that runs at uh, two different points, right? As I mentioned, there's the vertex shader at the front and then the fragment shader towards the end. Again, we're really talking about fragment shader here. So it's specifically a program that works in the context of pixels or what they term fragment, right? Little parts of the screen and then uh, de deciding what color it should be, right? So this is a great animation I find through this uh, online resource called Render Hell by Simon Schreibt. Uh, and this is kind of uh, showing an animated version of this pipeline I just talked about, right? So you have this GPU core, a little wizard at the top right, and it's going through all these steps to turn these points into triangles and then shading them uh, and then like colorizing them, right? And then like this image is output to the frame buffer, right? And one thing you notice with this image is that it's doing like it's waving to one, like once per fragment, right? Uh, and this is like a simplistic understanding and, and for all intents and purposes, think of this Think of this as how a CPU would approach it, right? Which is a CPU has to do one instruction at a time. But a GPU basically has the power of parallel processing with multiple cores. So that means that all this stuff that had to had one one wave each right, per action, now all of a sudden you have many, many of these little wizards and they can wave their own wand all at the same time very quickly and do all these things kind of like in a snap. And that's one of the main reasons why um, uh, GPUs are so powerful and so fast is that they are able to do things like in parallel instead of for a CPU, you have to kind of do things in sequence. And yeah, you can have multiple CPUs and coordinate, coordinate parallel processing between those multiple CPUs. But in this case, like a single GPU already has that power um, and can do things really quickly. Uh, and I love this infographic because it, it kind of shows like uh, kind of like a girdle feel of like, oh, in my head, what am I imagining is, um, is, is, uh, is, um, Sorry, a GPU doing. All right, so so how does the shader work? All right, so we've identified there's a GPU, right, and the shaders are little programs that run inside that pipeline, uh, the graphics pipeline. And as I mentioned before, a fragment shader is th that piece of code that runs on every fragment. For example, a pixel it doesn't have to be a pixel, but most of the time we're talking about a pixel, and it calculates a color for that pixel to be. And it's really good at math. It's super fast in math. Uh, and actually, like a lot of the demands you'll see these days on on graphics cards, it's kind of hard to find one. Is actually because of crypto mining and machine learning and a lot of different industries that want to utilize this powerful, fast, multi-core math processor uh, to do stuff in parallel. Right. So, for example, like even if a machine learning or crypto doesn't necessarily deal with a graphic that's output, it can still take advantage of the fact that it's very good at parallel processing math. Uh, and, and use that to, to basically do very fast calculations, right? All right, I'll take you through a pretty simple example of what a shader is, all right? So let's say we want to just have, let's say we have only like nine fragments, right? Like a three by three uh, pixel um, screen, like a tiny little screen. And um, in shader code, uh, usually things are expressed from zeros to ones. And so a color, uh, zero is black, right? Kind of the absence of light. And one is white, right? The, it's all the all of the light spectrum is displayed at once, right? So you get white light. Um, and technically, this is expressed as like RGBA, right? So it'd be zero 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 one, right? And one 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 one, right? Um, but in this case, I'll just express it as a single number, 
And so in an example of uh, doing some specific color, you break it out into uh, uh, RGBA, right? So in this case, it's 0 0.66, 0 0.16, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how you would express the color. And GL frag color here, it stands for, you know, remember OpenGL, so graphics language, fragment, color. And this is the line that's kind of at the bottom of every, every shader code is like, what is the color that you actually want to output? So as we mentioned before, it's parallel. So each of these fragments is running this code at the same time. So they have no idea what the siblings are doing. They all just receive the same inputs and then they output a color at the same time. And so this is an example of um, uh, each, how, do you, how you might get each fragment to display something different. So in this case, we're doing a vector and then based on the X and Y coordinate, right? you will vary the R and the G, the red and the green. And the blue, let's just keep it at zero, right? And this is kind of a gradient that you'll see, right? So at the bottom left is zero, zero, right? That's the position. Uh, and so that's converted to black. Uh, and the top right is one, one. And, you know, usually in, in you know, Photoshop or Figma, the zero, zero is top left and one, one is bottom right. But in, in gra many graphics contexts, it's kind of the, the opposite. Um, and so, if you go through each of these fragments, you can kind of like think about what each value is. So for example, on the top right, one, one, zero, a full red, full green, no blue, that outputs a pretty bright yellow, right? And the top left, it is uh, no red, right? R is zero, because X is zero, right? And then Y is one, so all green. And then again, like blue is zero. So that, that makes sense. So you'll get a very strong green in the same case on the red. And then everything in between is kind of filled in. And so this is how you might get this kind of like nice, nice shader gradient. And um, I'm showing things in kind of these pixel, right, things. But uh, one of the things that um, shaders can do and GPUs can do in the fragment shader, shader step is basically interpolate and make really smooth steps in between everything. So that's why it's not really called like a pixel shader, it's a fragment shader, because the concept of a fragment is that it's slightly different than a pixel. Anyway, and so this is an example of like, um, how might we take uh, like an input, right? That's not just the X and Y position, right? An input that's totally unrelated, let's say some, some image, right? Some texture. Uh, and then how do we like modify that? So doing some basic image processing. So in this case, I'm taking this meme Right, and I want to invert it, right? So I'll do an invert shader. And basically what I would do is, you know, sample, right, colors from each position, uh, every pixel in the original texture. And then I will take that uh, each value, RGB, and subtract it from one to flip it, right? Uh, and then I'll end up with a color where everything is inverted. Uh, and that's like a pretty simple inversion shader. Um, and so one thing I didn't touch on yet is this idea of like texture. Um, so even though we're talking about images here, right? Images and textures are kind of the same when it comes to like what sort of data is stored on a computer, right? You're really storing like a long list of color values, right? So starting with the top left, you have this color value and then this color value. And so that long list of, of color values uh, that an image is saved as is also how a texture is saved. So in terms of like shader land, an image and a texture, they're basically kind of interchangeable. Um, and so in this case, we're like sampling things from a texture, right? So it's the same thing as like sampling color from an image. And the reason it's called a texture is because, uh, again, this whole graphics pipeline was made to do 3D stuff, right? So the idea of like taking an image and like applying that texture to some cube to make like a cube look like bricks or something, right? That's like a very like gaming 3D graphics terminology. So that's kind of why it's called a texture instead of, you know, like an image. So as I mentioned before, uh, most of you have used shaders before. So Photoshop, uh, in, in my view, is basically a graphical tool for working with shaders, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a way for you to interact with shaders without ever having to think about any of this GL frag color, sampler 2D, any of this stuff, right? It, it allows you to do image processing, allows you to do art, it allows you to just do color adjustments. Uh, which is exactly the stuff that shaders are really good at. And so uh, if we look at this example of like, um, actually I'll just switch over to Photoshop. Uh, we have um, this, this image here and then we have some layers on top. I just drew some, some colors on top. And uh, based on this uh, blending mode, you can change uh, kind of how these two brush strokes appear um, on top of the image below, right? I'm sure this is something every one of you has played with before. Uh, and one thing I'll point you to is that some of these um, blending modes are named in a very confusing way 
And um, it wasn't until I learned about shaders that I understood why they're named the way it is. So for example, multiply, to me in that head was always like, okay, like multiply is when like I have an image with some white and I don't want the white to show up, right? So I'll kind of use it as a way to do some quick masking or something like that. Uh, and the same thing with like, you know, linear dodge for add. I never thought about like it as adding. It to me is just dodging. It's just making something really bright. Um, but if you look at, if you kind of sit down and actually a couple others are difference, right? Difference is kind of like uh, subtraction actually, subtract and then divide, right? These are, these are like the four basic arithmetic math expressions, right? And they also happen to be blending modes and that's not a coincidence, right? And that's, that's because what's really happening, um, you know, underneath here, Oh, I've kind of lost, lost track of where I am. Oh, here we go, right? So if we look at a uh, uh, multiply blending mode, right? Uh, it's a, actually a very simple shader. So if we take these two layers, right? Uh, top layer is green, the bottom layer is purple, and they have these RGB values, right? Uh, when you multiply things, uh, again, in shader space, everything is zero to one. So let's convert, you know, 115 to zero to one. So that'd be like, 0.45 or whatever, right? These are all the values in zero to one space. You just multiply every R, every G, every B, and then you end up with an output color, which is this kind of like muddy looking uh, purple, right? And that's actually exactly how it works. Like if we look at um, Figma, right? Which is where I created this, this asset, this layer on top is the green and it's set to multiply, right? And you can see uh, it's literally taking these colors and multiplying the values and getting the output here. Right, and so uh, if you think about multiply, this kind of makes sense, right? So uh, if you take um, a black layer and you put it on top of anything and you do multiply, it stays black because black is zero, 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 and zero times anything else is zero. So it's always gonna turn anything below it into black. Whereas for white is one, 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 anything times one is just itself. So it makes no impact on whatever's below, right? So it's kind of cool to think about, oh, okay, like, if, if that's what multiply is, then divide is basically the same thing, right? You're dividing the top by the bottom. Uh, adding is the same thing. You're just adding colors from the top to the bottom, right? Uh, and it subtracts the same thing. You're subtracting the, the top from the bottom, right? There's all these kind of like math concepts now uh, start to make blending modes make a lot more sense. And that's why, for example, when you're doing something like add, um, there's no effect sometimes, right? So for example, like this image is pretty, pretty black over here, right? So Let's create a new layer and let me draw like, you know, this purple on top of it, right? Uh, let me dial it up to 100. So this purple, and I'm gonna set this to add. It doesn't really do, I'm oh, sorry, um, no, set, set it to subtract, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really do anything to the black underneath. That's because black is already at zero. So subtracting this purple value from zero is still zero. Uh, and the same thing for um, uh, add for the color white, right? So if I move this over here, I'm not really affecting that white that much. Like I'm lightening up a bit because it's not pure white, but if it was pure white, it would be doing nothing because white is already one and one plus anything, you can't really go above one. So it's just gonna cap out at one, right? Anyway, so getting a little, little mathy, but um, you actually find that all of the Photoshop blend modes, um, I found this table online, it's a beautiful website. Uh, if you just Google Photoshop blend modes uh, equations, right, you'll find that each formula here is actually a pretty simple equation, right? You have the formula for lighten and screen, and it's just kind of really simple uh, kind of combinations of uh, the, the target layer and the blend layer, right? So target, I think, is whatever is underneath. Okay, so that's how, like, Photoshop, right, is basically a tool for working with shaders, right? It's really quickly doing a, a lot of these kind of um, math, right? Uh, without you having to even think about math. And if you've ever played with the liquify tool, you can you know you can like distort things. So I'll kind of touch on that. So animations are something that are pretty pretty handy to do in shaders too. And you can get very specific effects because um, you're really taking uh, these pixels and based on the, some time constant, right? Some, some time variable, right? Like as soon as the animation start, you start with the number zero for time. And then like every frame you increase that. So you start one, two, three, four, five, six. And so over time, you can take this you know, time variable and you can use that to do different sorts of animations. So um, let me start over this slide again. So uh, if we look at this image here right, in London, um, and let's say we're this fragment right here, we're running this shader, fragment shader for this pixel over here. Uh, 
Um, what I can do is basically say, okay, like based on the, the cosine of time, right? And if you know about sine and cosine, it basically takes uh, some, some number and then it, it turns it into a value from thing like negative one to one, right? So it's kind of giving you this like nice oscillating motion. And so in this case, let's say we want to sample this texture that, that's, that we have, and then we want to, over time, we want to sample slightly to the left, then slightly to the right, slightly to the left, and slightly to the right. And so you might end up with something like this, where um, over time, you're sampling the uh, kind of like the, the, the pixels, but like kind of like in like an oscillated format. And this is not, you know, the precise equation, the actual equation is like, um, let me find it. Uh, the actual equation is more like this, right? So um, it's some cosine where we're taking the cosine of, of the y and then we're offsetting the, the x. So that's how you're kind of getting like this distortion from top to bottom and left to right. Okay. So, um, so we've talk, talk, touched on a couple different ways that shaders can take information in and like output a color, right, to get different effects, right? So in this case, we're taking uh, not only a texture, but we're also taking some, some time, right? And based on our time, we're doing a little bit of math where we can kind of like oscillate it a bit. Um, and uh, this is kind of like the basic kind of like technical architecture of a shader, right? A shader uh, runs for each fragment slash pixel and it takes a number of inputs, right? It can take textures, so it can like read images and like sample things. Uh, it can take um, a uniform, which is like uh, something that's con uh, shared between every single fragment, right? So the time is the same no matter which fragment you're at, you're at right? Or you can have variings, which are uh, variables that are inputs that vary from, from fragment to fragment. So for example, the position, right? Every fragment has a different position from zero to one. Um, and so these three types of inputs is something that a shader can read and then it finally will output like colors, right? In, in the form of like another texture or it might write directly to a frame buffer. Um, and then you can kind of like do loops, right? You can, you can run something through a sh shader multiple times, right? You can call it like a multi-pass shader or you can run things through multiple shaders, right? Kind of chaining shaders together, uh, doing some post-processing or something, right? So, this is an example of, of chaining, right? So obviously in Photoshop, chaining shaders just means like layering stuff on top, right? And for each one, you set a different blend mode or you, you have a certain part that's erased that you can see through. So you're kind of like chaining and, and combining the results of these shaders to get together. Uh, whereas in like 3D uh, kind of game, game design and 3D modeling, you might see this more like obvious kind of like chaining, right? With this kind of node interface where you can see uh, what the output of each shader is at each step and kind of like combining them together uh, to get some sort of cool effect like this lava effect. Okay, so we've kind of touched on, in the, de in the, in the process of defining what shaders are, we've touched on what shaders are used for, right? Because that's kind of, you kind of need to use these examples because it's kind of, if I just, if I just like started and I was like, this is what a shader is, that would be like a little bit hard to grok. Um, but like, what are some like actually more concrete use cases, right? We've talked about things like setting colors, image processing, so like manipulating colors a bit. We've talked about a little bit of animation. Um, so in the real world, like in games and software, how, how are shaders actually used? So this is a pretty common one, right? Uh, because <laughs> 3D engines, they're really all doing their best to fake 3D, right? All we have is LEDs on the screen. We're really trying to use those LEDs to make your brain think that it's 3D. So these are a couple of examples of techniques that uh, you might've heard of, like, like a bump map or displacement map or normal map. And these are different ways that a shader would take some texture, right? Like this brick texture. And then it would do something to the resulting uh, image, to, to the resulting fragments. Uh, so for example, like displacement map, it would actually push and pull the surfaces out so that you actually get this kind of like realistic brick texture that you can see on the side. Uh, or you might look at something like a normal map, which are as a different way to look at um, a texture with this like purple to red to blue kind of like uh, color. Uh, and it's generally um, used to fake lighting. Um, another example is uh, in gaming, right? So you might use this uh, displacement map, right? Which we just talked about like as a way to like offset, offset pixels. You might use it to do um, like a water texture. And this is, this is a, a, a video snapshot from a great video series from uh, noclip.website where the, uh, this developer has kind of broken apart um, different shaders um, in, in actual games. So this is in, in the Mario game, they're 
exploring how to do like kind of like a water ripple effect on top of like the stone texture. So just talking about how like based on the displacement map on the left, uh, you can have different effects to make it look like it's actually water. And maybe the water is moving or the water is, 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 is growing up and down and you can get these really cool effects by just passing in this, this texture and then depending on if it's black or white, you know, you're shifting the pixels in a different, different direction. Uh, it's a very cool vi video, I'll, I'll link to it later. Um, and this is a, an example of a, oops, of a performance hack, right? So in this game called uh, Breath of the Wild, you, it's an open world game. So you can see kind of like very far in the distance and performance wise, it's not really a good idea to render like millions of trees, right? In the distance, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a bad use of resources. So one thing that it does is if a tree is really far, it would actually just replace that tree with a flat image of a tree. Like it won't be an actual like 3D model in space. So it would be like a pre-generated trees that you can kind of draw on these like little triangles, right? And so for every tree, every every kind of like direction that a tree faces, it, it'll, it'll kind of like generate, you know, like, I don't know, like 16 or 20 something different like images that the game engine can use. And uh, to make it even more convincing, what it outputs is not only just kind of like the image of the tree, but also what we mentioned before in a normal map, right? And a normal map is kind of like embedding into 2D image uh, information about the direction of of um, of a 3D shape, right? So, for example, like on the right, it's it's kind of more red. It's saying that like the normal, right? Normal is kind of like if you if you took an orange and you stuck a chopstick through it, like the the chopstick is the normal of the the point where the chopstick has pierced the orange. And so, in this case, it's like okay, what is the if we had to draw an arrow that's like perpendicular out of the tree leaves? Like which direction is it? Right? So red would be like this way, and black would be this way, and green would be this way. Um, and so, oops, sorry. And so in this case, you can actually use this to fake the lighting, right? Because we have information about uh, what this is like in the 3D space, but even though the tree is 2D, we can use this trick to um, uh, draw some point of light, and based on the normals that are already pre-calculated in this texture, we can create this kind of fake lighting effect, right? Which Looks a little cheesy here because we're just breaking it down from an angle, but from a distance, you can't tell. It's very cool. Um, this is another example of something you could do with shaders. Uh, uh, Runway ML is a really cool tool where you can do a lot of cool video, vid video effects. And one of the things uh, Runway does whenever you upload a video to it is that it will uh, immediately process you know, the video clip and then pick out things like humans and it will create all these different like um, textures, like pre-calculated textures that you could use to create some effects. So for example, like now that we have uh, all of these uh, information about this, this, these three humans and kind of like uh, uh, the distance from the edge of the human to the center, right? That's, that's kind of like these wispy shapes in the middle, right? This is the furthest away from the edge. And then here are some um, versions of the, the, the frame where the human is completely gone, right? You can do some pretty cool effects, right? Where, uh, because we know the edge, right? Through the, through the middle three images, right? We know kind of like the, the edge uh, of the of the uh, person and so you can do these really cool like clipping and masking effects um, now that you have this kind of like texture pre-calculated um, this is a project I made uh, it's a Chinese calligraphy shufa simulator and you know you can think of it like a watercolor simulator and the whole idea of it was like using shaders I'm able to very performantly uh, do this calculation of what happens when like water ink water-based ink like bleeds on paper. And so here's an example of me testing the, the, uh, the, um, the dilation, right? So if you look at this image of these, these red brushes here, right, you can see that they're kind of growing out. And on the top, le top left, we have this array of numbers and it's just showing the, the kind of like top, you know, 20 numbers or so. Right, so if you see like when I get, when I bring the brush towards the top right, you can see the numbers increasing, right? From three to four to seven to 11, right? So you can see them slowly uh, increasing in number and that's kind of correlated with how bright the red is. And that was just like an early test for me of saying like, how can I encode uh, kind of like wetness information into a texture uh, and use that to decide how to like bleed this image out. Right? So for example, on the bottom right here, you'll see that like, you know, on the top left it's zero. So it's, it's like dry, right? And, and four is like kind of more wet and eight is like very wet, right? And over time it like dry as well. So let me show you like how this actually works, right? So um, 
in the this, this, this Shufa app, I actually have two textures primarily that I work with. I have one canvas texture that actually displays what the ink is. And then I have a wetness texture. And that texture is something I never displayed to the user, right? It's just for all intents and purposes, the data structure, it's, it's some sort of like a, a state, right? Where I store how wet the, the canvas is. Uh, and so for example, when you first start, it's all zeros as I just showed, right? It's totally dry canvas and the canvas is empty. Uh, and then let's say like I touch down the brush right in the middle. And so let's say uh, whenever I touch the brush down, um, immediately the, the wetness is set to like nine, right? Because like uh, it's a dollop of water and over time I want to like dry out and dilate. So I'll immediately draw a, a black dot in the middle, right, at that position. But then I go into this kind of like um, simulation, this watercolor simulation, right, where uh, first I'll dilate it, right, and this is faded out at the bottom because, you know, we're not doing anything to the canvas yet. But in the top, just look at the wetness, right? First we dilate it. So we have the nine and every step out, you know, I'll turn the neighbors into nine. Uh, and then I'll dry it, right? So you know, over time it should stop dilating, right? It should like the ink should start to dry. And then uh, after we dry it, then we actually do the bleed. So that's when we, we stop working with wetness texture and then we actually like uh, draw it to the, um, the canvas. And so uh, the next frame, it kind of repeats, right? So we have, if you saw in the previous frame, we have like the eight, right? In kind of this cross formation and the corners are still zero. But the next frame, you know, that's when we dilate it once again, right? And so now everything is an eight and then you dry it once, so everything's a seven and then you bleed it and everything's, everything is now black. Right. And so there's a lot of properties you can tweak here where uh, maybe when you draw the black dot, when, when you fill in the ink, maybe you don't want it to be like completely dark. Maybe you just want it to be like 10% black. Right. And so that means over time you can have this like nice layering effect. Uh, and the same thing, you can have different controls for like dilation. Like right now I was just doing dilation where it would just step to the right, to the left, to the top, to the bottom. But you could have it also go diagonally. You could have it be more spherically. Uh, and you could have it dry faster, and you can have it dilate faster, and you can have the starting value be not nine, but like one. So it's like a very like dry brush without not a lot of ink, or you can have it be like 20 and be like the, the like wettest brush that you've ever used. Um, and so something I've been working on, just like experimenting with it uh, in, in the web context, I was rebuilding it recently. And instead of using black, I used white. And so you can get some really interesting effects where like uh, on the way to white, right? Which again, RGB is like one, one, one. If you're kind of adding up um, you know, like fractions of, of the color, you kind of get these nice like gradient effects. Uh, and one effect you can kind of see here is that uh, if you're, if you look at this intersection right here, you can see that even though this, this stroke has already been drawn, right, and it's already all dried out, um, once I've like covered the wetness again, right, now this is wet again and it will start dilating again, so the ink will bleed out. So it's got a really cool effect. Anyway, this is a cool project that uh, I've been working on on the side. Um, and um, this is something that I haven't really touched myself, but um, if you've ever been kind of like around the 3D space, you'll, you'll, heard, you'll have heard this term called like sign distance fields. And it's the idea of like creating art with just shaders, with just math, right? Painting with math, no textures, right? So you're not loading in any images uh, necessarily. You're generating everything like on the fly in Scratch and Shaderland. And it's like the most, it's the most wild stuff. So here's like a very simple example. How do you draw a circle in shader land, right? So if we're in GP, in CPU land, right, not shader land, we might think of it like this. Okay, I have a center point. I'll go to the center. I'll step outwards by a radius, and I'll kind of just draw around and like every single every single thing, like if it's in that kind of like uh, area, I'll fill it in. That's kind of the very like top down CPU model of like graphics, um, and it's very intuitive. <laughs> uh, but in shader land. Um, it'll be a little different, right? Because again, we're, we're, all we know in a fragment shader is that I'm, I'm one of these fragments. I don't know anything about my sibling, right? So you still start with the center, right? And uh, one of the things that you'll do is actually just look at the length from the fragment. So let's say we're in this fragment. We'll be like, okay, what's the length from me to the center point, right? And then we'll use uh, this, this math function called step, uh, and I'll explain it. Uh, real quick, but it will basically um, help us determine how to fill in the color. So a step works like this, right? So if you, let's say you just have this like curve uh, and it, from the Y position it goes from like zero to one, right? Um, usually it's like kind of like a gradual, like uh, linear graph. 
but if you pass it through a step function, what it does is kind of like, it takes uh, this like smooth graph and it snaps it like this, right? It's kind of rounding. Anything that's above like uh, here, it kind of snaps up. Everything that's below here snaps, snaps down, right? So it's kind of like looking at whatever this, 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 this arbitrary line that you've drawn and say anything on this side is one, anything on this side is zero. And so for example, you know, that's why you might, where you might specify the radius is here and then everything that's inside the radius is gonna be black. Everything outside the radius is gonna be white. Uh, and that's how uh, a step would work in this context. So let's say we have a radius of six, right? So that's the, the line in the middle of, of the step. And then um, we're testing every, every single fragment we're kind of like running through this equation, right? Uh, let's say we're in this square and our distance to the center is like four. And if we run it through a step, it'll say, oh, four is less than six, and then we'll snap it down to zero. And so that's how we output zero, 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 right, black. And then uh, for a pixel that's outside of a circle, like let's say it's like um, this one right here, uh, let's say the distance is seven, which is greater than six, and so if you pass it through step, it's gonna be like, mm, actually you should be a one, which is white, right? And that's how you might end up with um, this output color as zero, one or zero. And it's, it's gray here just for visualization purposes, but pretend it's white. So, I apologize if that's not like the clearest explanation of like this difference between like uh, shader shapes and like G and non-shader based shapes. It's just kind of like my, my, my basic understanding of it. Um, but there are a lot of these functions in shader lens, step, smooth step, uh, a lot of these kind of like math expressions that help you do things that <laughs> you want to do, but you can't use the regular tools that you have that you're used to from non-shader land. But when you come into shader land, you have to learn all these different techniques. All right, so as I mentioned, you know, in the CPU land, it's kind of top down, right? You go to a pixel, you do some calculation, and you tell that pixel what to be, right? Whereas in GPU land, you are the pixel. And the only information you have is what inputs are passed in, remember? The textures, the uniforms, the variance. And then, and then based on that information, you decide what color you are, right? Um, and so here are some uh, other more examples of uh, sign distance field, like math-based um, modeling basically right so they're modeling this bird and also animating it right only using math only using equations in a shader they're not loading any textures in they're doing you know things like dot product and and doing like matrix math and stuff that i don't really truly understand uh it's very cool and uh, inigo um inigo quiles q q u i l e z he's this really brilliant uh sign distance field kind of like pioneer and this is the type of stuff that Inigo does, is they're able to make this like 3D model of this person only based on math. And if you look at these math equations, like I don't know what the fuck any of this stuff is. <laughs> but if you watch the video, it's like, oh, you're taking a cone and that cone becomes the nose somehow, right? And you're, you're doing all these like math operations to like smooth it out and round it. And um, anyway, it's pretty crazy stuff. And if you ever use Blender, sometimes like some of the functionalities that you use, like, like let's say you want to like blend between two shapes, right? All of those are using like pretty complicated math similar to this, right? And so um, the idea of like using this math uh, in a shader, right, coding it is, is, is not too far off from, you know, things that you'll see in a 3D modeling tool. But to me, it's just kind of wild that someone can use this and kind of like intuitively like paint shapes because they understand the math so well. Okay. So we're gonna to come to the end of uh, this video. Um, just to recap, we talked about a graphics processing unit, right? The idea of a graphics pipeline and how it's made to um, for 3D graphics, right? And that shader is a type of program that runs in that pipeline at very specific step. And specifically, we talked about the fragment shader, right? And the way a fragment, we talked about how a shader works, right? It really takes these inputs, right? These textures, the like there's something like a time or the position of the fragment and it outputs a color, right? It's all it's responsible is for itself, for the fragment. And then with shaders, you can do all sorts of stuff. You can like do some basic image processing. You can uh, color some art. Um, you can, you can uh, you know, make 3D models out of math. Uh, there's tons of stuff. And um, one thing I'll comment is that like this stuff that we're seeing, this like sign distance field stuff that we saw at the end, to me, this is like, an emergent art, right? It's kind of like, it's, it feels like black magic because like in a way you're, because shaders were made to simulate 3D graphics by shading, right? Like a shape that you drew in 3D. Only like a subset of people have kind of like unlocked the capability of shaders because they kind of like deeply understand the math 
and they're able to use it to do a bunch of stuff that it wasn't really like meant to do, right? Like shaders weren't meant to like, you know, do this kind of stuff necessarily, but because like math is this amazing tool, you can actually just make a shader do this stuff and very, very quickly and performantly because it's all running in parallel. Uh, and so to me, it's like, um, you know, if you sat down today and you're like, okay, like let's, let's create a programming language that helps people like 3D model stuff you would not end up with like this stuff, right? This, this, this would be involved at some point, right? So at some point, low, like in the program, you would have to write some math, but as far as the language that you have the like end programmer use, like it would never be like this, but shaders are kind of this like dark art that's kind of encoded into our hardware, right? Like there's limitations on what kind of code you can add to a shader because it's only what the GPU understands how to run. And so people have like, taken these constraints and really just kind of like gone wild. Um, and it's really just based on this, I guess, sim simple <laughs> graphics pipeline, right? It's just like, oh, within fragment shaders, we can do all this wild stuff. So like, let's do a bunch of wild stuff there. Uh, and as I touched on before, right, you can do everything from 3D rendering, image processing, you can make creative tools like Photoshop, 3D model with sign distance field, and therefore you can make art with all this. And if you're interested in learning more, I touched on a few of these, but definitely check out the book of shaders. Uh, it's a great way if you actually want to start programming shaders to learn a bit more. Uh, Render Hell is where I got those, the cute little wizard animations from by si Simon Schreibt. And, and it is a great website that does like video game graphics analyses. Uh, and it's, it's where I really first started to internalize like what a GPU does and what a shader does. Uh, Freya also does some amazing content on YouTube where she has videos on like, you know, Bezier curves and shaders and all sorts of like kind of more mathy kind of video game 3D graphics uh, concepts. And as I mentioned before, Inigo Kielas does uh, all this like sign distance field wizardry. Um, but yeah, if you have any, any thoughts or questions, uh, please let me know in the comments. Please do uh, like and subscribe and share this video with your friends. Um, I, this is just like scratching the surface of this stuff, right? Again, I, I've kind of built up this knowledge, right? Through pulling together all these resources. And this is how I understand GPUs and shaders today. If you come back to me in two or three years, I'll probably have a much more nuanced understanding, but hopefully this is enough to kind of give you a primer of like what the heck are GPUs and shaders and start thinking about it in a way where you can start to Google questions and start to understand like, oh, like what happens if I want to do a shader like that does this, right? And that's definitely something I recommend you go out and do. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much and I'll see you next time.